Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the August 18th, 2020 Planning Commission Text Change Committee meeting. My name is CJ Mann, and I'll be chairing today's meeting. Uh, please understand that we are operating in a virtual environment and will likely be doing so for the foreseeable future. Uh, I would like to ask everyone for their patience as we use this platform for this public meeting and others. There may be slight delays as we transition between speakers, presentations, and participants. If any participants have issues with the technology, please send us a message to the moderator, uh, Laz Perez, um, who is operating in uh, moderating this meeting. Today, we have two items on our agenda. I would like the commissioners to hold all of our questions until the end of the conclusion of the presentation. Um, our first item that we'll be talking about is text change TC 14 19 site planning, uh, plot planning and revisions. This text change represents a major overhaul of how different development types are categorized. As such, we will use our time today to get an overview of the proposed changes from staff and we will reserve a more detailed discussion for a future meeting. Uh, Mr. Mark Holland will be presenting on this case of behalf of the city um, and members of the public who have signed up to participate and speak. Please do so um, after Mr. Holland has made his presentation and after I call upon you to do so. Mr. Holland, you're up. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And just one as uh, Laz shares presenter, uh, roll over to me. Okay, thank you so much, Keegan. Uh, this is a uh, TC 14 19. It's a revision to the plot plan site plan uh, regulations within the UDO. And this is just an overview of of what uh, what is within that text change. And uh, we can uh, discuss this in, in greater detail at a, at a future meeting. Uh, next slide, uh, Keegan. Uh, this is an amendment to the UDO to incorporate a three tiered system for categorizing site plans uh, based on a construction type and level of impact. Uh, it would break these down into two categories, the uh, major and minor for modifications to approve site plans. It would also conform the site plan standards to the new uh, chapter 160 D of the North Carolina general statutes. Next slide. The UDO currently is structured in a way that it requires a hierarchy of development and review for approval procedures. These uh, vary with complexity and uh, projected impacts uh, for uh, proposed developments. Generally, the uh, structure uh, consists of plot plans, which uh, involve minimal uh, UDO requirements and can be approved by administratively by staff. Uh, the next is site plans, which would require uh, full UDO requirements and is approved by staff in most in instances. Uh, subdivision plans uh, would uh, are also subject to full, full uh, UDO requirements and approval uh, by staff by most in, in most in instances as well. Uh, rezonings are uh, based on the review and discretionary approvals by the city council and special use permits are reviewed and um, a decision is made on those by our board of adjustments. Currently, we have a uh, minor development, which can be classified as, uh, for example, a uh, single family uh, development or a small addition to a commercial project would need approval of a plot plan uh, to move forward with construction. And we have a major development, which is uh, things such as new commercial uh, uses on uh, vacant property. Uh, and that would need approval of a site plan to move forward with construction. The uh, 
The goal of the proposed uh, graduated three tier system is to uh, require more information and improvements for projects that have bigger impacts and less um, less information for those projects that would have less of an impact. The, uh, the proposed uh, text change would address the following concerns. It would provide a definition for site plan. It would remove all references to uh, plot plans. Uh, we would, uh, that term would no longer be used. Uh, create a three-tiered uh, site plan uh, structure that would differentiate site plans based on their level of impact uh, on the site. It, it would uh, also remove all references to development services, uh, which is no longer uh, the name of the department, uh, which it now replaced by the uh, planning and development, but it place all references to development services with the term the city. It would allow for the classification of modifications as major and minor. It would give the planning commission the final authority to uh, review and approve uh, any major modifications to site plans, and it would make the uh, language of the ordinance consistent with the new 160 D of the North Carolina general statutes uh, for development regulations. As far as purpose and need, uh, the proposed text change uh, would create uh, clear levels of site plans and their requirements. The establishment of the standards, the establishment of standards that are proportional to development projects should uh, reduce staff review and approval times, and it should reduce the number of projects that would require any sort of public hearing. Uh, these changes are also uh, necessary to achieve consistency with state law. That was available for any questions. I would also open up the floor to uh, the C. Attorney's office, uh, Mr. York, if he has anything additional to add to this presentation. Okay. Um, at this time, does um, any of our fellow tech change committee members, do we have any questions on what we've just seen? And let me see if I can. Matt, Commission Thomas, I see your hand. Yeah, uh, I was. Uh, I guess this is more so to get context as to the cadence of today. I mean, I noticed that that presentation didn't really have, uh, I mean, get that that's like the high level goal. So are we, are, are we expecting to like get into actually some of the content today? I was just trying to like understand where we're at in the process. Uh, today, we just wanted to discuss, go over it uh, at a very high level, uh, what is being proposed. Uh, there's a lot of information here, and there's a few other items on the staff level that need, that need to be addressed by, uh, by us at the staff level. Um, so this is more or less to get you, uh, get the information in front of you and give you a brief overview of what is being proposed uh, without getting too far into the details of it. Okay, However, if you do have comments that you want to share with us while we're looking at a couple of other items, it would be good to hear those as well. Um, one clarification, the reference to modifications being approved by the Planning Commission, that is just for modifications to site plans that were approved through some other type of quasi-judicial approval. So we don't anticipate any of those but we had to provide for them just in case there's still some old part 10 site plans out there that came in for modification just wanted to clarify that okay so would it would it be kind of i guess it's just there's so much information in here and i guess you know i'm pretty familiar with plot and site plan as i, I think most of the other commission committee members are but um I guess, would it be possible? It doesn't have to be at the moment, um, but it seems like we're at the end of the, the presentation for this particular uh, text change. Um, I, I was struggling a little bit to fully 
wrap my head, and it might just be a simple interpretation. But, um, so that I'm understanding that the people of applicable standards. I was wondering if you could just kind of like talk through the logic behind it to be able to best interpret how to read this. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take the first stab of that, and Justin and others can jump in and, and correct me where I where I misstep. First and foremost, we went from two. Can I types. pause for just a minute? Yes. Is everyone else getting an echo from like someone that has a, has a speaker on in the background and it's creating feedback, or could everyone mute who's not speaking? Okay. We went from site plans and plot plans to a three tier system. Basically, the tier one, as proposed in the text change, replaces the old plot plan, but addresses concerns that have been raised over the past several years with the plot plan limitations. And so I would call tier one as sort of plot plan plus. Okay. Tier two is a hybrid. It primarily change in uses that exceed tier one limitation. So the goal when you look at the table of uh, applicable standards, the goal is for tier one and tier two, uh, the vast majority of which are change in uses, uh, looking to minimize the exaction that those change in uses or modest expansion would be held to. Does that make sense? And so in reserving the full force of the code to tier three cases, which are most of your what you'd call a greenfield development, except there's a couple of a few exceptions to to those that would still be considered either a tier one or a tier two, such as single family house is a greenfield development, but that would be considered tier one. And so that was the the logic behind coming up with this table of what standards would apply to which tier of site plan. And it involved taking into consideration the experience of the plan reviewers and the types of cases they came across that didn't make sense that they'd be put through the full rigors of the code. Justin, if you want to add to that, you you had mentioned some examples in a conversation we had earlier. Sure. So yeah, really um what we're trying to do, as David said, is address um an equity issue and with a more refined categorization than what Synco provides. Um the way the existing code is, you're either one or the other, a plot plan or a site plan. And we have found that certain developments um where because of the, the blunt instrument of just using required parking as a proxy for the intensity of a development that was driving certain projects into a site plan pro, uh, category, which we felt wasn't uh, very equitable. So for example, a, um, an office building downtown that has been in existence for 30 years, wanting to switch out tenant and now become a restaurant or a bar. Um, certain types of those projects got kicked into the site plan category, which means a couple of things. Um, it means they had to go through a longer approval process uh, in order to get their approvals. And in, in order to get there, they often had to get relief from certain standards that you see in the table here, things like amenity area and um, open space, um, tree conservation, those sorts of things where they just physically couldn't comply because it was an existing built out site. And so the city wasn't getting anything out of um, forcing them to go down that path. We weren't actually getting any improvements. The only thing we were doing was delaying um, and complicating the process. 
So that table is really an attempt to think about when certain things would apply to each of the three categories. I hope that helps. Yeah. Commissioner Miller, I see you. Oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Thomas Hill, I don't know if you finished your point. Yeah, I, I guess in, um, I guess just to try and wrap that up. So an example would be, I was just trying to understand with the A through E, I understand that they have the footnotes in that, in that chart and um, and so, like the first, the amenity area. I'm just trying to like visualize this in my head, and this is these might be stupid questions, but um, to just kind of finish the thought. Um, so for that first one with amenity area 1.5.3, is that basically saying that if if proposed stormwater device is to be screened is that a new stormwater device like i'm just trying to understand the logic of this so that so it's like if the development requires a new stormwater device you would have to abide by 1.5.3 is that kind of the logic here Yeah, so so what the yes, the the in the table, anything with a dot is applicable and then anything with a footnote refers to the footnote. Um, you've actually you've um, touched on you heard Mark uh, say at the end of his presentation, we had 1 or 2 things to clean up and and you've uh, happened to touch on 1 of those exact things. Uh, Commissioner Thomas. Sulo. So, um, that is something that we recognize was not entirely clear and, and do need to go back and address that. But yeah, the intent is when the footnotes are there uh, is kind of a conditional, um, a conditional application where those those standards may be applicable in certain circumstances, but not for everything in that tier. Okay, okay, that that's helpful. Thanks, Commissioner Miller. I saw your hand. Yes, I was just going to see if we could. I, I understand the logic between behind having three tiers. But trying to figure out what the practical implications of that are, um, it talks about you know we've talked about how to it would reduce the the some of the process required to get approval for these different tiers, um, but the chart that we have only shows a difference between the table of applicable standards, not necessarily a change in the process required to approve each of these three tiers of projects. So I was going to see if you could. Um, help clarify what practically speaking is going to be the difference and then also just trying to understand the table better i had the same note just understanding under the b4 table the first standard for amenities under tier under tiers one and two does this mean that for tier projects that fall under tiers one or two that amenity standards are only applicable if a proposed stormwater device is to be screened with landscaping or uh, if you could just and trying basically just trying to understand the practical implications of putting these things in three tiers. And if you could walk us through how the table works. So to your latter question there, um, that is how it works. Um, that particular provision is something that we do um, that needs to be revised. So we, that that are the intent was not to say that amenity area is only required for those tiers when a stormwater device is proposed to be screened. Um, so that that particular uh, footnote does need revised. Um, but moving, so, okay, then the, just moving to step back then. If we could just walk through the second. Sure. So um, setbacks are always applicable in a tier three plan. And then footnotes A and D would apply to tiers one and two. So moving to footnotes A and D. Setback standards for a tier one project, setback standards are not applicable to existing improvements on the site at the time of plan review, but they are applicable to the proposed improvements. That would be correct. Yes. 
Um, and under maybe adding that clarification as well. So under and under existing, it would existing improvements would mean both existing improve just any existing condition on the site. It doesn't necessarily need to have been a prior improvement of the site. Well, only the improvements would be subject to the setback. But if they were previously improved, you mean but wouldn't they have also been previously approved? In most instances, yes, but depending on the age of the building and whether an intervening rezoning has occurred, they, there may be new or different rules applied to that property now that weren't in place when the property was constructed. Yeah, I think you might be referring to something that may be considered a, a legal nonconformity. I mean, basically, I, I think the, what I'm hearing is that the existing improvements is a bit, I think, maybe confusing in like general terms. Like, is the idea of existing improvements is basically like anything that's there that's built. It, it's pre-existing the application. Is that correct? I believe that was the intent. Yeah. Okay. Existing conditions. Or structures or. Yeah, if you, if you had a property that was improved and you had a structure that was 10 feet from the property line. Or uh, yeah, just use that 10 feet from the front property line, but now because of a zoning change or because it was built in part when the old code was in place or whatever, there's now a larger setback of 15 or 20 feet. Going to the site plan process, you'd have to get relief potentially for setback because you don't comply with this. What we're saying is you don't have to worry about complying with site plans on anything that already existed. Whether it exists because it wasn't prior improvement or because it just was there from the initial construction. Correct. I think I think for I think just I think Blanny, I think that they're using improvements as like anything beyond just beyond dirt that's already there before you before you're submitting on whatever the new application is, whatever the new site plan is. I think that the the word improvements like I can see where it can be misleading, but I think that that's like anything that's on that site that's not dirt or grass, um, like is an improvement no matter how long it's been there prior to submitting a new application for any sort of future improvements for it. I don't know if that's just reiterating, but that's I think that that's kind of where the question stemming at from my interpretation. Yeah, Commissioner Fox, I see your hand. Uh, uh, you've had your hand for a while. Go ahead. Um, I don't know if this is a question for um, Justin or um, David. Um, we've, we've touched on it because we're talking about the definition of existing. But is there a separate and important differentiation with historic preservation? I, I recall the plot plan site plan issue being a significant hurdle with historic preservation projects. Um, and I recall it being one of the one of the recommendations in the historic preservation toolkit was to make this change to change the threshold of, of what a plot plan is and was what a site plan is for a historic preservation project. Have, have you all coordinated that or is it inherent in the existing? <laughs> I don't know, Roberta, that it's um, that there's any explicit distinction here, uh, or, or, um, or what the relation is between something that I'm assuming you're saying um, needs a certificate of appropriateness versus the type of approval it has to go through for staff. Is that what you're asking about? Sort of. I'm, I'm asking around this, like. 
this existing and how you define existing improvements, and then also how it relates to the process if it changes projects that also have to go through the COA. Um, um, so to the second question, it wouldn't change that process at all. Um, Typic, you know, folks would, would go get their COA and then they would come in and still depending on the type of tier that the project fell into, that would dictate the process for where staff would go through the, the actual permitting of the improvements. I know when historic preservation projects come in for COA, they're defined as a, as a major or a minor COA. So, in theory, could you have a minor COA that's a tier two and a minor COA that's a tier three and a major that's a tier one and a major that's a tier two or three? Do you know what I'm asking? Like, are we, are we creating um, additional subcategories of different types of projects? It, we have not proposed to change in this text change what qualifies as a major or minor COA. So that is standing on its own. Um, so the answer is yes, I guess you could have a, you could have a tier one that's a major. You could have a tier two that's a minor. Um, but we did not, we did not alter what's major and minor COA. Uh, we didn't touch that category with this text change. I think it might be significant to look at um, just coordinate that piece with historic preservation because I, I imagine it'll change part of their process as you as you react back and forth across the aisle. Does that make sense? Okay. Commissioner Haber. Commissioner Haber, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. I swear I clicked it the first time. It just didn't work. I don't know. Um, I'd like to just go back to the second part of uh, Blanny's question. And, uh, uh, Justin and Mark, I understand that there needs to be some clarity around the language and I agree existing improvements and some of those other things. So um, I don't know that we need to spend a whole lot of more time on that, but I, I am curious about the practical process of the review of the different tiers. And so my understanding that in a tier one, which is defined above this table B4, the only items that the only standards that will be reviewed are those UDO sections that are listed in the applicable standards should they meet those footnotes. So let's just say this particular project uh, meets a, a and D. Let's just say for a tier one. So those are the only things that are going to be reviewed in the tier one are the setbacks, the build to the height, pedestrian access, blank wall, ground floor, et cetera. All these other ones, right of way, public improvements, all the other UDO requirements are not going to be reviewed. Is that my understanding of this? That's that's correct. And it's um, consistent with how what what today is called a plot plan. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, that's that's what I right. And then and then I. I, again, there is a lot of text in here and I'm, I'm trying to absorb it. Like, I think the rest of the folks here. Um, so, generally, there is a shorter review time. There's a progressively longer review time, I guess, as you move up the tiers. Is that the thinking? It's, it's not an, uh, it, that's certainly a byproduct of what happens when all, when when the more improvements and the re more requirements that come into play certainly lead to, you know, a, a more in depth and longer review time for staff. Sure. Okay. Thank you. But the procedure more or less is going to be the same. The question is how many hurdles do you have to jump? Depending on which tier you're in. Yeah, that that's the question I had too. Sorry. I spoke up Tim. Do we have any other questions from okay, Commissioner Tomasillo? Um, yeah, I, I guess it's just um ha, has staff um and the department gone through 
through exercises of side-by-side -side case studies of existing uh, site reviews and plot plan reviews to compare how they would fall into these tiers. It's, it does sound like a lot of this was spurred from a lot of projects that had gone through the city. And so, you know, and I know that back when we were doing cottage courts, you know, it was super helpful to actually see how this was applied, like in practice, while we're shaping some of the text. And it helped us catch a few things that made sense on paper, but didn't necessarily make sense in practice. And I know that, um, you know, that the team with development services and planning is super well versed in this stuff. Um, but, I, you know, I could see it being super beneficial to the process if we could even walk through, you know, a few examples so we can visualize in our head, like what that process might look like and how this is benefiting. Um, because it's gonna, it's gonna happen now or it's gonna happen to approve this. And, you know, we're trying to figure it out react like retroactively versus proactively and and i guess i would love to try and set a try and set a standard um in delivering these that we are actually using real case studies or precedents so that not only us but so that the public can really understand how this is impacting it and um, I think it helps add, tr add transparency and accessibility to the conversation. Um, and, you know, and I think it just helps really understand some of the nuance for some of these things, because I, I know, I, you know, I'm sure Brian, you know, has a ton of experience, like from an applicant side, like where you might be reading something and assume one thing, but then when you actually see it going through permitting, and through review, it's very different. And so, and, and I know that a lot of the goals of this is to um, eliminate uncertainty and to increase expectations on both sides, which will really help everything and to deliver better projects. And so I guess I just, I, I feel like it, it I, I definitely see it being some work, but I feel like it would be better done now than retroactively on every single project that's submitted to the city. And, and just was curious if, if any of that has been done, if, if it has, if it can be shared, and if not, if we could do that. Yes. Oh, when we were formulating this, I'm um, oh, sorry, uh, Justin, I didn't mean to jump in. Uh, Go ahead. When we were formulating this language, we used uh, examples of uh, site plans that were currently in review or existing uh, to help try to put some of these um, to to uh, establish these tiers, because when we were initially going through this, we were trying to figure out exactly how many tiers there should be in place. And in formulating those tiers, we used current examples of projects that were in the city or some that have had already gone through the process. So we've already done some of that work through projects to see how they would flow uh, with what's being proposed here today. Justin, if you have anything to add to that, I, I think I got it. But. Yeah, absolutely. And I was just going to say we, we'd be happy to share some of those examples uh, when we come back with you all. If, if you wanted to, if you thought that would be helpful, we'd be glad to uh, share, look at a couple of them and say, you know, this is this is how they were uh, categorized under the existing code. And this is how they, they would be under the proposed code. Yeah, I mean, I think that'd be awesome, you know, just for some context to help us ground it and um, and to have a visual of the types of projects you know, and how they meet and it gives us some projects so that we can kind of ask a few more kind of, you know, uh, specific just clarification questions too. So thank you. Commissioner Miller, I saw your, I saw your hand and then Commissioner Haber, I'll get to you um, after Commissioner Miller makes her comments. Mine was back in the chart. Um, just something to flag if, if it wasn't already, or maybe I'm not true, I'm not understanding it. Um, but footnote D as well, every time there was an A, there um, almost most times there was an A, there was also a D. And it said, um, 
that these standards would apply to this tier of project if demolition and reconstruction of an entire structure was proposed. And um, I was going to say if if I'm just trying to figure out why that footnote is necessary, because wouldn't this if it's already applicable to that tier project, wouldn't it apply to every every applicable standard within that tier? Wouldn't I mean? What's the difference between this this standard is applicable to new improvements and that dot versus it's applicable when demolition and reconstruction of an entire structure is proposed? Trying to figure out the difference between D and the dot, basically. I'm not sure that I follow your question, but the difference between D and the dot is they're not all everything in tier one and tier two are not demo and rebuild. I mean, some some tier one, tier two projects are just expansions of an existing building and so forth. What the and that applies to certain issues where it's hard for an existing building to comply with a provision in the UDO when the building was built under the old zoning code. And so what we were looking at there was existing improvements because setbacks applied to buildings, but then there's also parking setbacks in the code and so forth. So that's why we use the term improvements as opposed to building in that in that footnote A. But we were looking to where an existing building shouldn't be evaluated, you know, under blank wall if it was built before blank wall was a thing that was regulated under the code. Um, but if you're tearing down and rebuilding, then they want the building to comply with the current standard. If you're just wouldn't that be the case in a, a wouldn't building, that be the case always? Yes. It was just a clarification. The 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 purpose of, of the footnotes were twofold. One to to catch things where it made sense that a provision of the code should be complied with. And two, to try to make the table read clearer and know when you really do have to deal with this. I mean, right now, tier one, blank wall, tier one and tier two, for the for the most part, those first few categories in the table are not applicable the tier one and tier two. And so there's only a few instances where they would be, and that's the purpose of the uh, footnotes. The footnotes to say when it would apply, not when it would not. Commissioner O'Hara, so, I'm sorry. Just, I just wanted to clarify. So um, for setbacks for a tier one project for a new improvement, would a new improvement have to comply with the setback standards in chapters two and three? Yes. And demolition and reconstruction would also have to comply with sections two and three? Yes. That's the same for, okay, gotcha. Great. Okay. I'll move on. Commissioner O'Haver, I saw your hand. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. I just want to follow up on Matt's comment to Justin. I think, Justin, it would be helpful to to share some examples the next time. And sort of to our questions here, it would be helpful if we made sure we had one example for each one of these footnotes and different scenarios, so that maybe it might make clear per per Matt's comments about how these are applied and some of the questions we have. So I just wanted to ask if we could um, do that if possible. Okay. Yeah, we can do that. Thank you, Justin. Uh, if we are done with our questions, does anyone from um, the public have any comments or questions regarding what um, regarding this text change? Les, I, I don't. Les, can you hear me? I don't know if you if anyone has signed up to speak or not. Uh, I don't think anyone has signed up for. Uh, to speak, but I don't see any raised hands or any uh, chats to me, so I'm going to take that as a no. Okay, 
Commissioner Thomas Ullam, seeing your hand. Yeah, I just had one final question, and I think this is maybe uh, following up a question that a two part question that uh, Blanny had, but um, I didn't. I might have missed it, but was there anything about when when talking about the process? I guess it's you know I again knowing that this is trying to simplify and and be more transparent and more equitable, and so and knowing that I think some of the inequity was the unintended consequences of particularly time and engineering requirements and all this other stuff for projects that were maybe only changing use or something. And so I didn't see anything about like, and maybe you just don't have it yet, but about the like process for if I submit tier one, what are the expectations? If I submit tier two, what are the expectations? And if I submit tier three, what are the expectations as far as cost engineering it, and engineering might depend on the footnote of course so maybe avoid that for right now but as far as cost and time has that been discussed yet or so it it's been discussed um a lot of things that are process related are not codified in the code um, those are things that, you know, that we will work with and, you know, the current planning staff and the customer service center as to, you know, certainly this, this change will lead to, you know, changes in what applications look like, um, you know, more detailed or less detailed applications may be needed for certain types of projects. So, yes, there will be changes to those things, but they're not necessarily, um, a lot of those things aren't necessarily codified um, with code language. Um, one one thing to do um, that we did clarify in this change was that your ones um, would not be subject to any public notice requirements that would otherwise um, uh, that tiers two, two and three are subject to. So that's that's one example of how um, that would, you know, save time cost those sorts of things, but, but many, m many of those other items are not in the code. It's just how we kind of process the applications. Okay. Do you, do you think with some of the examples, you could add, even if it's just a bullet or two about just for context, you know, previously this was a three month re review process and more likely than not, it will be less or something, you know, something like that. Like, even if it's, just, just for context, even if it's not in the code, I think it just again help enrich our intake of this information in context for it. Yeah, we'd be glad to do that. Great, thanks. So Mr. Miller, I saw your hand, and then uh, Commissioner Javier will get to you. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to note. I know that I, I wanted to. I have several questions and and comments when it comes to the definitions of tier one versus tier two. Um, but did staff say that this is essentially they need to keep working on it on clarifying some of that language, not quite ready for prime time? Or do you want any of those comments now to make sure you capture them or? Yeah, please share the comments. Uh, what we were referring to is there's some changes to some footnotes that has been identified. And so that's what we were looking at, not to my knowledge, any changes to the definitions of the tiers. So if you have comments about uh, the definitions of the tiers, please share those with us. Yeah, before we do, Mr. Paul and uh, Mr. York, when, um, yeah. when is our deadline for action on this? When, when do we um, need to have this finalized? Right now, I don't believe text changes have a deadline, but I'm, I can't swear to that. Mark, do you know? Uh, I, the the deadline, worst case, it's 90 day. Yeah, the, the deadline for it is September the 28th. September 28th. Okay. Okay. So I'm just trying to see if, we, if we're if we going to have another meeting or another series of meetings to iron out questions and to footnotes and others uh, before we have to refer it to the full commission. Um, Commissioner Miller, did you have anything else? Well, per, to that point, procedurally speaking, do we, it's, it's my understanding we have several other text changes coming down the pike as well that, and we only text change committee only meets once a month. So seeing how far we can get at each one of these meetings might be um, 
the best use of time. But I, I don't know. Do we have more coming down the pike? Yes, there are several <laughs> in the queue. Okay. Gotcha. Well, and so before I go through my comments, maybe I'll let Commissioner O'Haver um, ask his question. Thanks, Blanny. And I, I don't know if it might again procedurally. I'm not. I'm still kind of new to this. If if you had a significant amount of comments, would it be more time effective to submit those to David, and then we could review those sort of offline? Or if there were some very specific ones you want to make sure we talk about now, uh, just an idea. I guess my my comment was going back to uh, Matt's question in. And Justin, I, that's sort of the question. That's sort of what, what I was getting at earlier was, you know, what are the benefits of tier one, tier two? And I guess just by the nature of how much you are reviewing, the review time will be reduced. But I, I do think that currently you set milestones for, for ASR reviews and others. And I, I, I think it would be helpful to set milestones for the different tiers for the review periods, even if it is based on the number of standards that are applied due to the footnotes or something along those lines. But I do think that would be helpful. Sure, I agree and we'll do that. Um, really, you know, really tier two is the only thing that's really new here, right? Because tier one, uh, while it's a new term, really is just what today is called a plot plan, right? And tier three is what you're thinking of as a, as a full blown ASR uh, administrative site review. And so there's only just, we've really only inserted this intermediate category. And yes, I, I do agree that, you know, we'll have to go back and rethink um, uh, potentially fees, review times, applications, the sorts of things that go along with that. Okay, great. Thank you. Mr. Mann. Yes, sir. We do have a question from the public, uh, Michael Birch. Okay, before we get to uh, Mr. Birch, um, Commissioner Miller, let's finish out your thought and then we'll get to Mr. Birch. Sure, I was gonna say, I've got a list of about um, seven comments or quite, maybe eight comments and questions to the definitions where they might not be particularly clear and I could run down those quickly. Procedurally, um, Commissioner Haver made the, the point, I could provide this in writing, but I know that we've discussed that in the past and one of the challenges is that staff can't make red line changes unless we discuss them at the table and the, commission, the committee agrees to have staff make those changes is is that the case and i would be happy to just you know work with staff and, and send over a red line but um you guys are not allowed to make those changes without the committee voting on them is that right well blaney i think it would be helpful too if you just if there's eight of them you just sort of a high level ran down them and then we can decide procedurally the best way to, to deal with those I, i'd like to know kind of because i'm sure some of your questions might be some that the public have or that we have here so i think that would be helpful Sure. Uh, before I do that, that might take a little bit. So I want to let, um, if, I, I'm fine with letting Mr. Birch speak if that's okay with everyone else. Okay. All right. Is that okay with everyone? Okay. Les, um, go ahead and put on Mr. Birch so he can ask um, his questions. Great. Um, good afternoon. Can you all hear me? Yes, sir. And not to uh, toss the data back to uh to y'all but i would be great if y'all want to talk through commissioner miller's comments that would give me some time to get off of uh capitol boulevard and uh somewhere where i could focus on <laughs> focus on this so you know i'm i'm ready to go now if y'all want to handle it that way or um right with commissioner miller going through her comments as well <laughs> okay we want you to be safe Michael. we want you to be safe <laughs> yeah. All right, get, yeah, get somewhere where you can where you can talk and be safe. So, Commissioner Miller, we'll, we'll go ahead and go with you. Appreciate it. Perfect. Right. Okay. Uh, well, I'll just start running down from actually the the top um, section one specific approval authority. The commission is responsible for final action regarding number one says design alternates. Um, I I believe at the July seventh public hearing, the city council designated that authority to the appearance commission, not the planning commission. So I think that should be struck. No, that's the code. What we did was we we changed the code so that council could give it to either the appearance commission or the planning commission. And if that changed because of workload of the two commissions, we didn't have to go back and change the code. So the code uh, provides council with the flexibility. And so 
Um, and you'll see that again because we're coming. We have some additional text changes that are similarly related, and so they will say the planning commission or appearance commission performing the quasi-judicial duties of the planning commission as designated by city council. That phrase you'll see again in future text changes, and that was so that council could move it from one board to another depending on caseload, workload, and so forth, without requiring an amendment to the UDO. Gotcha. Makes sense. I um, I was reading the minutes from the July 7th public hearing, and I thought that the council had adopted something specifically delegating the authority to the Appearance Commission, but they that may be different than than the yeah, actual UDO. It, it, it was not a change. code change. Gotcha. They just they made their designation at the same time. Yes. Okay. Um, moving down to section four, um, A3, it said a zoning permit is required for the following types of activity as regulated by this UDO period, food trucks, temporary uses, fences, and walls not requiring a building permit. Is this saying that walls that don't require a building permit will require a zoning permit? Yes, yeah, certain walls. Um, uh, there are there are zoning standards for walls related to things like height. So um, even though they may not require a building permit, they do require review by a zoning staff member to make sure they comply with those standards. Okay, just wanted to make sure that was that was the intent there. Section five, um, in just that introductory paragraph, maybe this is a typo that was left in. Um, it says that these changes would ensure there is no available tree conservation area mm. and relettering of all subsequent subsections. And I wasn't sure if that was just maybe left over from something else. Yeah, I'm not sure where that language came from. Yeah, that it should gotcha. just be inserting this new section. And renumber and relettering. I don't know where that came from. Sounds good. Um, so then moving down to B, the definition, and, and some of these are policy, some of these are clarification. B1A Romanet 2, um, a change in use of growth floor area. So a, a tier one project would include a change in use of growth floor area of 10,000 square feet or less in an existing building. Um, if there are some practical issues with creating a cliff like that with 10,000 square feet. Um, and the, the Romanet 1 specifically talks about how, and I think the goal of Romanet 1 was to, was to address some of the change in use um, challenges when folks want to change and change the use of the building and it might actually decrease the amount of parking required. And we didn't want that to trigger um, a full um, tier three site review previously uh, the, for the previous version of the tier, C, tier three site review. So um, we addressed that issue in Romanet one by saying that a tier one is the construction um, of any building when the required parking does not increase by 10 spaces or 10%, whichever is greater, which I think is a great change. Um, but then we go on to say a change of use when the gross floor area is 10,000 square feet or less. If, if it was a very large building, as opposed to just saying a square footage cliff requirement, creating both a square footage um, maybe or percentage of gross floor area change as well, uh, might make more sense if something is a very large building, especially if that change of use, let's say decreased parking. Um, that was more of a policy question that I had on that one. The, the origin of that Romanet 2 was uh, staff was looking at a square footage that regardless of the of the impact on parking, you could say a tier one. And so mm -hmm. um, that was why that was added. 
because the, the list is any of those. So if you fit any of those criteria, you would be treated as a tier one. So notwithstanding your parking increase, decrease, if you're just changing less, if it's a change in use of uh, 10,000 square feet or less, whether that's the entire building or whether that's just a fraction of a larger building, that's a tier one, notwithstanding your parking impact. Gotcha. Um, so maybe the proposed might be, or, well, I, I see, or a percentage of the total gross square footage, but I guess that's that's perhaps contrary to the point if it's a larger building. Um, okay, that was just one comment. The next is um, comments on Romanet 4 and 5. Um, the, basically all of these refer to the following types of improvements. And this just says a civic use as the principal use. Does this mean a change in use to a civic use? Or is this saying that any building that has a principal use as a civic use can make changes and be, no matter the scope, and be within tier one? And the same question applies for Remnant 5, a change in use to a public park or any changes to a public park? Those are two of the examples of where a greenfield development would not trigger a tier three. So that could be a brand new park, establishing a new civic use under you know, 10,000 square feet or less. Those were categories of potential greenfield developments that would not trigger a tier three. Gotcha. So it would be a change in use to a civic use or a change in use to a public park. Or the beginning of a new use of a vacant property. Gotcha. But not necessarily any improvement to a building with a civic use. But the distinction makes sense. I think if you change, if, if, you, if you if you insert if you if it was a change from another use to a civic use and it was ten thousand square feet or less, I think that would qualify as a tier one. If you are starting a new use on a vacant property and it's a civic use of ten thousand square feet or less, that's a tier one. Um, if you're expanding an existing facility that houses a civic use, but you're exceeding the 10,000 square feet, that bumps you to a different tier. I got gotcha. you. I don't, know, I don't know if that answers your question. Well, I was just trying to clarify. Most of these start off with some kind of like a, a verb or, or a, a type of, um, even if it's a noun, a, a, an action noun, construction or, or that kind of thing. Um, and so this was, these were the only two that didn't have that and so I was trying to figure out what the improvement was that we that that the introductory clause was referring to. We can we can we can look at clarifying that language. Gotcha. And then would Romanet for that language would that be redundant with Romanet two? Once we change that to a change in use to a civic use for building that's less than ten thousand square feet. No, because Romanet four includes uh, a greenfield development. Romanet 2 is only a change of use of an existing structure, 10,000 square feet of an existing building. I so they're not, okay. they're not duplicative. Gotcha. Um, the next comment then is um, just generally about tier one projects. I noticed that accessory structures, the construction of an accessory structure is included in seven and um, some other buildings. What about the construction of an ADU? What type of tier would that fall under?
ADUs for reference are defined in section 2.6.3 of the code. And I didn't see that section reference in any of the tiers, which I guess would kick it to tier three, but I'm not sure if that was the intent. I, I think the intent is that an ADU would be a tier one and, and we may need to clarify that. Right. Yeah. Great. Um, so then moving on to tier two, I, um, I just noted in 2A, Raminets 1 and 3, that the, um, an, an earlier clause said that if multiple tiers apply, then the most restrictive applies. And was just noting that if um, the, a change of use requiring less than 10 new parking spaces under tier one would also fall under a change in use requiring less than 25 new spaces in tier two under two a one so then in that case if the most restrictive would apply then that would be a, something requiring less than 10 new spaces would fall under tier two as well which is i'm sure not the intent and that's the same comment for two a remnant three about an addition of up to 50 parking spaces when tier yeah, one is can, up to 25 can, parking spaces. We can revise that to have more than, but less than. We can do that. We can create that little range to fix that. Sounds good. And then in 2A, Remnant 2, um, a, a change in use or a new use to a civic use um, of a principal site except with this in a building that has more than 10,000 square feet except for schools and places of worship under which tier would a change in use to a school or place of worship fall if it's more than 10,000 square feet that would go to tier three because tier three is what doesn't qualify as a tier one or a tier two gotcha um, and then, um, tier two, a Romanet for a new, a new commercial parking lot of any size. Or reuse of an existing parking lot as a principal use greater than 25 spaces. I was just. I think I think we can clarify that. that. I think the intent was that that um, twenty-five to fifty spaces applied to both a new commercial parking lot or the reuse of an existing parking lot. So we can clarify that. Gotcha. And would a new commercial parking lot mean, as opposed to an expansion of additional spaces, just clarifying the difference between what, when? adding parking spaces versus a new parking lot when that would be triggered or is, is that clear elsewhere? Well, it's a parking lot as a principal use. So we're not saying if you added a new parking lot to support a use on the property. So that's not what we're referring to. We're referring to a parking lot as a principal use. So the parcel. Correct. Gotcha. Okay. That was all of my comments um, to the definition section. And then under major versus minor modifications, I have I have a comment there as well, but that's that's it for the three tiers. And that comment was the shall instead of the may. Yes. Yes, we caught that as well. Thank you. What what section was that? In section section five. Excuse me while I flip through here. Excuse me, not section. Section nine, excuse me. Yeah. Section nine, E1, second line towards the end of it. Okay. We have and may be administratively approved, which shall be. Okay. May with shall. Okay, got it. Got it. And so that's, that was a, a typo that. Commissioner Miller caught 
and someone else in staff got it as well. So okay. great yeah. minds thinking alike. <laughs> Commissioner Miller, do you have anything else? I don't think so. Pulling it back up. I think that that's it. Okay. Oh, and I also wanted to give a big shout out to staff um, on the major versus minor modifications. I received a lot of feedback from members of um, the public about how intensely staff worked with um, the, the um, development DSAC and other stakeholders on creating this long list of minor versus mod major modifications and um, for many hours and many meetings and things like that. So just wanted to say thanks to you guys for, for doing that and, um, and thanks to everybody else in the public who helped as well. Okay. Um, Mr. Birch, are you ready for your comments? I'm ready. Okay, you're on. Appreciate it. So um, first, let me just say thanks to staff, uh, particularly Justin and David York, but I know many others in bringing this text change forward. Um, my comments today will focus on um, the different site plan tiers. Um, I'll try and one, give a couple of examples and I'm happy to you know, work with staff on you know bringing forward some examples to y'all for a future meeting. Um, but then I also want to make maybe two comments uh, as, as additions to the uh, to the list of, of tier one, um, or at least for consideration in, in that. So first, I would say um, this is in response to a few questions about timing and, and the impact of this on timing of projects, and I really see this text change aimed at, again, a lot of these changes of use um, that are because certain elements of the code, like dedication of right of way can no longer, you know, and exceptions to that can no longer be approved by staff. They've had to go to board of adjustment. And that has added a minimum of 60 days, but in many cases, 90 to 120 days um, to the process, and in many cases, just to get a waiver of a dedication of like two feet of right of way. Uh, and so, when someone's trying to put, uh, you know, a restaurant into an old blockbuster building, you know, what would normally be a very quick process because they're not adding any square footage, um, they're just doing a tenant upfit essentially. That has now turned into a six, seven month process. And so, yes, there will be timing benefits for staff on the things that they are reviewing, but there will also be incredible time savings on the applicant side who aren't just sitting there for four months waiting for the Board of Adjustment to get their case for a five minute, seven minute hearing. Um, and so, and I think it, this text change will also substantially decrease the volume of cases that have to go to the Board of Adjustment. Um, and hopefully, Planning Commission, Appearance Commission as well. Um, on the items that I'd ask you all to consider um, tweaking in the current text change, the first is um, in that column of you know, kind of regulations that are triggered. Um, and I'll just say this is something I think that's incredibly important just having this table because one thing the UDO does not do well is it doesn't put people on notice when certain regulations apply and when they don't. And so this, this table will help that incredibly so. Um, on down in the list, you'll see transition. Um, I would ask this to be something good for the text change to, committee to discuss staff, maybe to bring forward some um, recommendations on, but I would ask you all to consider maybe not having to comply with neighborhood transition regulations for a tier one. I'll just give you uh, an example. Um, 
existing shopping center built in the 50s um, that was there and it has its loading dock area backing up to a neighborhood that was developed right around the same time as the shopping center. Uh, shopping center owner wants to make some minor improvements to the loading dock area to help it function better. Because that building is within the neighborhood transition area, that requires uh, a variance to the neighborhood transition standards to essentially allow the existing building to remain. And so I think there are certain situations that, you know, can just recognize that existing improvements can remain even when you're making some minor modifications or additions. The second issue that I want to raise um, is including subdivisions or certain types of subdivisions. And the reason for that is this text change is focused solely on uh, site plans, which do not involve the creation of a new lot. Um, and here's an example of why I think including some limited types of subdivisions um, in this would be helpful. So let's say you have a, a shopping center that's all on one lot, um, but it's got, you've got your main strip, but you also have uh, an outbuilding that let's say was an old parties um, or an old bank branch, but they're all, but they're all on the same property. What this text change allows is a change of use from that bank branch use for that building um, to a restaurant use um, that is a tier one site plan. So because of that, that owner is not having to dedicate right of way uh, among other things or make streetscape improvements. But if that same owner as a part of the change of use and financing the improvements to that outbuilding needs to create a separate parcel just for that outbuilding um, because they want to, you know, limit their deed of trust just to that parcel, that subdivision is going to trigger many of the same regulations, at least as it relates to public improvements and exactions. And so while you could make the change of use and the improvements to that outbuilding without triggering dedication of right away, et cetera, just putting that on its own lot would trigger those regulations. Um, that's one scenario in the commercial context. I'll also note in the residential context, um, the subdivision of a lot into two lots when that parent tract is less than an acre is exempt from a lot of regulations like tree conservation and many of the stormwater regulations. But if it's not exempt or not a tier one, you know, under this text change, it's still having to dedicate right of way, install sidewalks or pay fees in lieu, um, and, and those things. And I'll just say the sidewalk issue has become a huge issue for a lot of builders um, because that impacts and takes away from their allowable impervious surface and counts against their allowable impervious surface. Um, and so I just wanted to raise those two issues um, and see if there can be some discussion over how to address those in this text change. And, um, but again, just want to reiterate how thankful we are that this text change has come forward. I can assure you that um, there are a lot of projects waiting on this text change. Um, to move forward so they don't have to be subjected to a three to four month wait at the Board of Adjustment. Uh, and so well, I certainly want the Commission to do their due diligence. I also want y'all to know that um, this is badly needed um, in the development community side. So uh, I can try to address if you have any questions for me. Um, happy to happy to answer them and just appreciate the opportunity to comment.
the staff or the committee have any? Uh, I said, Matt, uh, Commissioner Thomas, I see your hand. Uh, it was it was honestly more so. I mean, thank you, Mr. Birch. Uh, it was more so. I think building on what Mr. Birch said to ask staff about, you know, I think what they were going to reply to you because it is super interesting. The idea of if you can build an attached house, but if you want to subdivide it, you're basically you're going to have to meet a lot more um, requirements than if you left the attached house on the same lot. And if that's the goal, especially if affordability and accessibility, you know, it really helps when you have more fee simple lot structures and smaller, more residential infill. Any um, comments to Mr. Birch from staff or the rest of the panel? I, I would just say from staff perspective, we've, we've had um, internal discussions about the, uh, subdivision piece of it and have talked about categorizing you know levels of subdivisions as well um one thing that um we would have to check and, and maybe mr york knows is uh i don't know if we were authorized to look at subdivision regulations with this text change so um it it may be in order to make changes to those sections we need to we may need to go back to city council and ask them um if if they're if they're wanting to revise those sections as well or as part of a separate text change, but I don't know if Mr. York has any other uh, information on that. We may be looking at some other subdivision issues, um, and so I think that the cleanest way, if if there is support for uh, I guess treating certain subdivisions as tier one site plans. They're not, I mean, they're, it's a totally different provision in the code. So we would have, to, we could probably get the effect and the impact you're looking for, but it would probably need to be a, a part of a subsequent text change when we're looking more at some of the subdivision standards as well. And I'm not sure I'd have to go back and double check the chart to see if subdivisions on the list of things Council's authorized us to change. Uh, Commissioner O'Haver. Thank you. Um, just a couple questions about, about Michael's comments. And the first one, the transition sections, and um, noticing that tier one through tier three all have, have dots on there. Um, obviously a concern about sensitivity around transitions. I guess I want to understand uh, the, the scenario that, that Mr. Birch shared. Is it, am, am I correct in understanding that an existing improvement that is there that does not meet the transition requirement for them to make an improvement to their loading dock, they would then have to remove any existing improvement that does not meet the transition section. Is that what I understood that scenario to describe? Is there no grandfather clause there or? There isn't currently. Um, and that is something. Uh, so the, the transition requirements are applied to existing structures today and as written in the table right now um as mr Burt said it, it would apply to tier all tiers as well so um if that's so we wouldn't have to change that in order to have them not apply to existing um existing improvements whether that's through a footnote like we do through other um through for some other categories or if it's um just a blanket, remove the dot. Right. Yeah. Yep. Well, if if we did that, done. we would probably do it by revising section 1.1.11, which is where we have existing buildings and structures and we, um, if it was built before adoption of the UDO, they don't have to comply with build to pedestrian access, transparency, blank wall, 
and so forth. So, it, yeah, there's a couple of ways we could address that. Well, I think I, I think I have the mental picture, but but Justin, if you're compiling some scenarios, perhaps if if Mr. Birch could share that one, or I think I'd asked earlier if you could make sure we covered all the footnotes. I guess it would be interesting as well to understand since there are uh, five instances where tier one would be kicked into a full. ASR, I, I would like to see some scenarios if you have that on on sort of is that appropriate level of review for those sections of the UDO and and potential improvements or or change, you know, land use changes. Well, not land use changes, change of use. Sorry about that. Be happy to provide those. Uh, sounded like a very specific example Michael was uh, talking about. So if you wanted to share that, um, that'd be great. Um, but just to clarify what you're asking for um, examples of anywhere where there is a dot for tier one, is that what you're wanting to see? That's right. Or just okay. not, you know, not exhaustive, um, Justin, but, but, you know, all the other sections and the, the, um, relevant standards for tier one have footnotes except those five. And so since we are talking about trying to take a tier one, which would be a, a lower level of review and a, perhaps a quicker turnaround time, I just would like to understand why those five kick it all the way up to a tier three. And, and there might be, it might be totally understandable. You sort of show us those examples and we say, aha, now I get it. But the scenario that Mr. Burst just shared um sort of made me question about those five dots in the tier one just, just so you just to clarify and in case i'm misunderstanding you the dot under tier one does not mean that that is treated as a tier three it just means you have to comply with that particular code provision okay so tier one has to provide adequate parking so parking applies. You have to provide adequate parking under the code if you're a tier one. That doesn't mean that because parking applies, you're treated as a tier three. You're still a tier one. I don't. I may have misunderstood what you said, but no, you five dots that. do not do not trigger tier three. Those dots just say what portions of the code you have to deal with in a tier one. So okay. yes, thank you. I, I was reading that differently. So thank you for that clarification. So maybe maybe there's a little less again, maybe there might just be a couple examples that that folks from on this call could share with you, Justin, that we could look at that maybe they have some issues. And I guess the 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 example that he used for the subdivision was was also interesting. I understand that's a different part of the code, so I don't know how we would address it here, but the scenario that he gave specifically about the shopping center seemed like there might be some opportunity there to, to clean that up in a I guess in a different part of the code in the subdivision. So those are my comments. Okay, I'm hearing that uh, these comments, J Justin, when do you think maybe uh, all of these comments may be addressed? Because I'm, I'm looking at our schedule and maybe next month we're going to, I'm hearing that we're going to have a, a few more cases of text change to look at. And I don't want to get too bogged down. So I, I just want to check everybody's temperature on how they feel. Maybe another intermittent meeting between our regularly scheduled meeting in September where we could handle this and get this knocked out before our uh, next meeting in September. So um, that's just my thoughts on it. I, I think that's that's fair from staff perspective. Um, just just being realistic with all of the things that all of the, the work that you have on your plate or, or that you're going to. Um, so we'll do whatever we can to accommodate um, any additional meetings and, and be prepared for those. Okay, okay. Yeah, I would uh, follow up commission man Sam. I'd be willing to have another committee meeting because I, I do know that this topic has been out there. 
uh, for a while and it seems like there's a lot to do on it. So I'd be willing to um, participate in an additional meeting per your thoughts there. Right. Just I'm okay. Tim. Yeah, maybe in a couple of weeks we can come back and rehash this in advance and you know prior to our regularly scheduled meeting. Um, that way, I know we've got a lot of changes to talk about, and I don't think we're going to hash anything out as far as finalizing it today. But maybe by next meeting, we can start finalizing some stuff out in that you know that meeting that we're going to schedule um, in the future. So would that be September first, two weeks from now? Uh, would that be enough time? Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. So, the question: the question would be, Justin, would that be enough time to two weeks from today to um, hash all of these? Questions and comments about examples out. Well, I, I would just note that September first, we have um, the first city council meeting of the of the month, and that is a day session and a night session. So many of us will not be available that day. Okay. I say we look at. What was that, Commissioner Thomasillo? Sorry, I, I was just going to say it. It seems like we should maybe for a uns for an unscheduled meeting. Usually off weeks are the are the best weeks. Okay. okay. I'm looking at my calendar. I'm not seeing. Let's see. Uh, what about next Tuesday? Well, we 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 actually have a planning commission meeting next Tuesday. Uh -huh. Um, and a committee of the whole, so I'd probably, I, I would have to think maybe the, the second week of September. Gotcha. Okay. So it's off week for, um, you know, there is, there is a, there are other, you know, now committees are starting back up and everything. It gets a little tricky, but. Quick question. When is our next scheduled meeting for text change? September the what? Looks like the 15th. 15th. Yeah. The 15th. Okay. All right. So, yeah. Okay. So, the, the week of the 7th. And the 7th itself is Labor Day. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, the 8th. We had, there's typically a transportation committee meeting on that Thursday, the 10th. Um, but I suspect that we don't have anything on that agenda. So, we, that may not exist, but there may be a reserved time slot there. From four to seven on Thursday the tenth. Okay. That works for me. I'm not sure. About Unless it. there's a transportation committee meeting that day. And, and I guess also one question I had was uh, usually committee meetings are four to six. Um, I didn't know. Has that changed? At all. Staff. Not to my knowledge. Okay. okay. Every committee meeting I've ever gone to went to seven, so that's what I've stopped yeah, <laughs> on my <been> calendar. <laughs> so if transportation can I can at least say they start at four. <laughs> There's no agenda for transportation committee. I, I recommend that we or I suggest that we take that slot on Thursday the 10th of September from 4 to 6 or 4 to 7. And then that'll give us time by our next meeting on the, I think our next meeting is on the 18th. Or you said the 15th? 15th. 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 Okay. So by the 15th, then I think we should have to be able to hash this out and go forward with the, the numerous other topics that we'll, we'll probably be having. I'm available on the 10th. I am too. On the 10th? Okay. Good deal. And for quorum purposes, um, I, I may be going out at any moment for maternity leave. So may not be able to make some of these September meetings. <laughs> Congratulations. Hopefully can make it through this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So we'll tentatively schedule for the 10th. And I think uh, from the show of hands I saw, I think we should still have quorum on that. On that day, I think everybody except for Commissioner Miller should be able to make it. Okay. Um, 
I guess moving forward, does anybody else have any comments or questions regarding TC fourteen nineteen before we move to the second item? Okay, so moving on, the next item is TC six twenty, neighborhood transition requirements and senior housing. Uh, Keegan McDonald has a presentation uh, to present today. Um, same, yeah. So, Keegan, are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, here we are. Okay, thank you. So this particular text change is twofold, um, similar to some that you have seen more recently, um, given the slate of authorized text changes, we've chosen to bundle some for efficiency. Um, and this is one such instance. So there's uh, two portions to this, the first being neighborhood transition requirements, uh, particularly exemptions related to the neighborhood transitions. And the second piece being um, senior housing, which impacts um, both congregate care and um, continuing uh, care retirement communities as well. So these two text changes were actually authorized at the same meeting back in February. Um, they were both identified as low hanging fruit um, to address housing affordability and choice. And again, they were bundled together um, previously as a way to kind of expedite these items and, and remove them from some of the other recommendations that came out of that meeting that required a little bit more thought, um, research and discussion. So the first portion related to neighborhood transi transitions um, would first remove the neighborhood transition requirement entirely for single unit, uh, otherwise known as single family and two unit, otherwise known as duplex uh, two unit living cottage court um, and short term rental uses within detached house, attached house or townhouse building types when the existing or proposed building has a height of 50 feet or less. The second portion of this text or this section, excuse me, would remove the requirements for zones B and C for detached house, attached house, house or apartment building types in all mixed use districts provided the proposed or existing building is 50 feet in height or less. Um, the proposed use is permitted in the RX district and the proposed use adheres to any applicable use standards of the RX and underlying district. So to provide a little bit of recap, um, neighborhood transitions are seen as a way of buffering mixed use districts and uh, associated activity from residential districts. So they generally apply where a site zoned mixed use abuts the district boundary of a residential district. Um, neighborhood transitions consist of three sections or zones. These zones are zone A, uh, which is a protective yard, zone B, a use restricted area, and zone C, where height and form restrictions apply even to the principal dwelling or principal uh, building. Um, zone A is located directly adjacent to the lot line and could vary in width from 10 to 50 feet and commonly features landscaping, trees, and uh, some type of screening, be it a fence or a wall. Zone B is included in the overall dimension of zone A. Um, for example, if zone A is 10 feet, the remaining 40 feet can be within zone B, depending on the property use and building type. Zone B commonly features um, landscaping, playgrounds, accessory storage areas, stormwater measures, and surface parking, amongst um, some other selective select uses. And zone C, located furthest away from the boundary, um, is a, a um, height and form restriction. So it allows for the construction of all uses and structures permitted within the zoning district, subject to certain restrictions, um, particularly that at this boundary, a building can be no more than 40 feet in height and um, are allowed to increase in height by one foot for every foot um, set back from that line. And um, there's also certain blank wall restrictions um, related to the rear facade of a building within zone C. So again, neighbor transitions consist of these three zones. Um, and what is for, up for discussion today is 
when what types of uses and in what types of buildings may be exempt um, from these particular zones. So with the proposed changes, um, as I noted, they're really kind of um, twofold, and I'll actually go back two slides. Um, the first, in, the intent here is to really modify the language such that low intensity residential uses that happen to be located within a mixed use district do not have to comply with the uh, neighbor transition requirements. Um, this is just recognizing that really if, if you have a, for instance, single unit, single family home um, within a detached house that, that happens to be in a mixed use district, there's really no reason to buffer it at all from a residential district, which likely will contain the same use. Um, so we really just tried to capture some low intensity residential uses there and recognize that just as a function of existing within a mixed use district, we shouldn't have, uh, it should be held to additional buffering standards. Um, the second portion of this, which is maybe the, the larger change, is uh, we were instructed to find a way um, to encourage certain types of residential development within other mixed use districts. And currently there's an exemption that's provided to um, our, within the RX district for certain building types and uses that exempt them from zones B and C. So again, zones B and C are the use restricted and heightened form sections of the neighborhood transition. Uh, they do take up considerable space. Um, and these uses uh, within RX still have to provide a protective yard, um, but they can, of course, be a little closer than to um, the boundary line. And what we were instructed to do is find a way um, to kind of expand this exemption to um, other districts. So the solution that was arrived about, uh, upon was to uh, essentially um, and this exemption to detached house, detached house, attached house, townhouse, or apartment building types in a mixed use district where the proposed or existing building is 50 feet in height or less, provided again that the proposed use is also permitted in RX and adheres to any applicable RX and underlying zoning district use standards. And what that functionally means is that um, now an apartment building that meets these this criteria being 50 feet in height or less, it may be located in a, a different type of mixed use district, let's say NX or CX, um, would also get the benefit of this exemption. Um, and by limiting the uses to RX and requiring them to adhere to RX use standards, and um, any underlying zoning district use standards, this really limits the types of uses and buildings that would get an exemption, um, particularly because not many commercial uses are permitted in RX. Um, and most of them, uh, most of the commercial uses, specifically um, health clubs, medical office, personal service, eating establishment and retail have to adhere to the use standard shown on your screen here. Um, and so they must be located on the first floor of a corner unit in an apartment building type located at the intersection of two public streets. Um, they cannot exceed more than 4,000 square feet in gross floor area, um, have, are restricted in terms of their hours of operation and cannot have drive through or drive in facilities. Um, RX really only allows, as stated previously, a limited number of commercial uses um, and is really geared towards uh, higher intensity residential uses. So again, the exemption that would be extended to other zoning districts is really just trying to capture what's already uh, permitted in RX, but but uh, trying to encourage it within these other mixed use districts um, by expanding uh, the zones, the, the exemptions for zones B and C, which do tend to eat up a lot of site area. It would still have to provide zone A, which is the protective yard, which really provides the bulk of the uh, physical buffering with a wall, fence, um, and prescribed. The second portion of this text change is related to um, what we'll kind of classify or group together as senior housing. Uh, and so it's two parts. One is to align the UDO definition of congregate care and um, continuing care retirement communities or CCRCs with the housing for older persons exemptions of the Fair Housing Act. 
Um, the second is to remove the minimum site size and transitional protective yard requirements for CCRC specifically. Um, so congregate care is one of these uh, definitions that's being kind of altered or updated. Um, so congregate care in the UDO is a long-term care facility for elderly people who are able to get around on their own, but who may need help with some daily activities and have staff on call, includes assisted living and independent living. Um, so one portion of this text change is really just to update the uh, use standard related to um, the age of the persons within a congregate care facility um, and the types of other residents that can be there and just state very clearly that the facility must comply with um, the, the specific exemptions of the Fair Housing Act. Um, and this was really at the recommendation um, also of the city attorney's office. This makes it cleaner, make sure there's no conflict between the UDO and other um, applicable regulations that um, congregate care are subject to. Second is uh, continuing care retirement communities. So these, these, this is defined in the UDO as a facility providing a continuum of residential and health care services to persons aged 62 years or older, allows residents to continue living in the same complex as their housing and health care needs change. Continuing care retirement communities may offer a variety of services such as congregate care, skilled nursing, rest home, health and wellness, recreational facilities, support services, and entertainment and social uses. As well as, a, uh, as well as offering a range of residential opportunities, apartments, townhouses, cottages, a rest home must be provided as a component of a continuing care retirement community. So this is kind of seen as, again, a continuum of care um, and also providing a little bit more in intensity in terms of the services that are provided as compared to just congregate care. The change made here to the definition would pretty much mirror exactly that being made to congregate care Instead of providing a specific age limitation, um, which could be in conflict with future changes to uh, regulations beyond the city's kind of purview, uh, this change to the UDO would just cite specifically uh, the housing for older persons exemption from the Fair Housing Act um, to make sure again that there is no uh, conflict. In addition, um, the text change would make uh, two alterations to the use standards. Um, the first would remove the site size minimums um, for a continuing care retirement community. Density limitations would still apply um, based upon the underlying zoning district, but there used to also be a requirement of a certain site size, and that was seen as a practical limitation to developing continuing care retirement communities, um, which under the council's authorization, um, the intention behind this text change is to really promote them as there seemed to be a, a need for these types of facilities. And this was seen as a, um, a, a barrier to their development um, that didn't serve uh, really a specific purpose. Um, the second portion of the uh, text change, um, there's just some, some typos that are being corrected here, as you can see under F. Um, and then moving on to um, H and I, Elimination of the transitional protective yard requirement um, for continuing care retirement communities and um, also stating um, as required by state law that they must provide skilled nursing. And that's made clear here as a use standard instead of just being in the definition. So that kind of concludes my presentation. Um, I'm certainly happy to kind of go over um, any of the specifics and anything that uh, I didn't touch upon, but maybe in the staff report as well. Commissioners, do we have any questions for Keegan? Commissioner O'Haver. Thanks, Thanks. Uh, Commissioner Mann. Thank you, Keegan. Um, so first of all, I, I remember when council identified this as low hanging fruit. I think makes sense. It seems like if I, if I understand correctly, the definitions are supported by the attorney's office and are needed to get the UDO in line with federal and state regulations. And then and, and am I understanding this correctly that the, the transition yard requirements that were set for 
these types of housing is different than other multifamily projects. And so we're getting that in line as well. Is that, are those three points uh, correct, Keegan? Um, yes, uh, to the first two, um, that the definitions, we did consult with the city attorney's office and their recommendation was to, to update the um, language as shown in the draft ordinance. Um, these changes were identified as low hanging fruit related to kind of housing affordability generally. Um, and to your point related to the transition yards, um, I'm not sure specifically about the history of how these transitions have been applied um, to other types of residential um, development. Um, perhaps someone with a little bit more tenure could, could speak to that, that fact, potentially Justin um, and or Eric, if they'd like to jump in. Uh, but I think you are on the right track there, uh, Commissioner O'Haver. Commissioner Thomas -Solo. Uh, I think I, I had another question that so clarifies uh, or, or is maybe trying to drill a little deeper. Uh, Commissioner O'Haver's question: Is there like an example? I know it says I think it's primarily around the apartment building type, but Keegan or someone else, could you give like an example of how this transition visually will help on like a quarter acre lot in a certain in in rx like what it was versus this will fix it yeah um i don't have a specific um diagram but if i can maybe go back to my presentation and, and just highlight that neighborhood transitions um yeah and i think that could actually show it fairly succinctly um but we're but you can let me know if it's not if it's not clear so on this slide um you can see the zones a b and c um, zone A can really vary in terms of its depth. Um, and so if someone is wanting to, let's say, maximize their site and they are willing to put in um, heavy vegetation and landscaping and, and in, in fact, a wall <laughs> along their boundary with the residential district, then a zone A protective yard could be as small as 10 feet. Um, so under the current regulations, the only types of residential projects that would be really exempted would have to be located in RX. Um, and outside of that RX district, they would still have to comply with the zone B use restricted area and zone C heightened form, which could substantially reduce the amount of area on the site that they could really build in. Um, and so practically speaking, um, this would enable residential projects within RX or the mixed use district um, to build within an area that they couldn't currently build in, in terms of the actual principal use on the site. So um, right now, if you wanted to construct a residential project outside of RX, let's say in, in X, um, and you would be restricted from placing a building within 50 feet of the district boundary of a, a residential district versus with this change, because again, it's a relatively, let's say medium intensity residential project, um, you would only have to comply with the zone A protective yard and thus, you know, you'd still be subject to certain setbacks, but you would be getting buildable area um, potentially, which could lead to an increase in the number of units um, and hopefully would also reduce the amount of uh, review time that, that staff would have to spend looking at the site. So it's really just trying to expand the, the privileges we've given to projects within RX to all mixed use districts and limiting it um, only to certain types of residential projects that are under height and, and within certain building types. Okay, okay, that, that certainly helps. Thanks for clarifying. And I guess one other question I had was, um, you know, short term rental is a commercial use, so I was just confused why it was in there. I feel like it shouldn't be if we're focused on housing. Um, you're referring to C, C that um, they would not have to comply. Yeah, um, I think what the, the intention there was to make sure that, let's say, a, a detached house um, that wants to utilize 
a room um, or potentially the entire detached house for short term rental purposes um, would not be thus subject to um, neighbor transition requirements when the uh, intensity, which is really dictated by the, the building type in this instance, would, would not, uh, it is not being increased. It's rather just kind of the function of the, the occupants that are staying there. Um, and so we, that was the, the, the goal. Um, it does kind of, I, I see your point that it, it's, the others are residential uses, whereas short-term rental um, does kind of fall into overnight lodging. Um, but in its specific nature, um, that it's really only within certain types of residential structures, so detached house, attached house, or townhouse building types, we didn't want that to get caught in the web of then having to provide neighbor transitions for someone who's, who's wanting to use their um, existing home, let's say, as a, a short-term rental. Okay. I guess it's just, for me, it's confusing because we have a text change coming down the pipe for about short term rental, which I think is a much bigger policy question. And I guess I would just see this from the outside. If I was an attorney and I have a two or three person practice, you know, it's like where a lot of attorneys I know utilize housing, detached houses and mixed use districts. Um, it starts to really make it muddy, in my opinion, if we're really focused on this for housing, then any lower intensity commercial use, either all of them should be included or none of them should be included. Understood. Yeah, and that's it's certainly something um, that the committee can authorize us to, to go back and, and refine or remove, um, of course. Um, I would say that uh, you're, you're correct that the short-term rental tax change is forthcoming um, and will provide specific limitations on short-term rentals. Um, and, and potentially that would help clarify basically how they're being viewed, um, maybe a sort of almost like a hybrid use in a way, um, being residential in, in nature, but obviously having a, a commercial element uh, um, but, but I, I certainly see your point, uh, related to that specific use. Yeah, I, I, I mean, for me, I think it cleans it up a lot. If we stick to what is classified as residential uses as residential uses dictated here. Um, I, I don't know how the rest of the committee feels, but it just, it just doesn't make like in my, like the logic just doesn't add up, uh, to me, um, it's not a huge sticking point. I just, I think that the last couple months we've really been trying to use like clear logic and transparency as to why we're doing and how we're doing it. And that just doesn't seem to make sense on my part why we're prioritizing one, you know, nebulous commercial use for, over another, you know, we're assuming intensity, but, you know, then you could say a yoga studio or anything else. And it's, you know, so it's, I just am, and trying to be a little bit um, more equitable uh, when it comes to those sort of classifications. Commissioner O'Hare, I see your hand. I just have a procedural question. Um, if we are trying to get this out of committee and back to the full planning commission, but there's this one issue, um, again, sort of not have a lot of experience on this, what is the best way if we want to keep this moving and not have to bring it back a month from now? Um, if there's a concern about that uh, short term rental in section 1 C. Uh, uh, how do we what's the best way forward on that? This is Eric Hodge. If I could speak to um, Matt Tomasulo's. Concern those other uses that are exempted. If they're located in a mixed use district and they follow. The limited use standards associated with those uses, if they were in a residential district, are there because the RX district does allow for some commercial uses, office, restaurant use, et cetera, as a component in an apartment building. And so they can locate in an RX district 
And clearly, you can't transition from those commercial uses to a, to other portions of the building that they're lo co-located with. And so that's why um, when those specific uses are going to be located in a mixed-use district adjacent there too, there was some thinking that perhaps if they followed the same use standards as if they were were in the residential zoning district, that perhaps a transition would not be warranted because they're allowed in the districts that they're trying to transition to without a transition, if you follow me. So a coffee shop in an apartment building in RX doesn't have to provide a transition to neighboring parcels in all instances, just because it has a commercial component. Am I am I on track here, Keegan? Correct. Uh, what if, what about a coffee shop in a historic house? You can't locate in RX as a standalone use. It can only be in an apartment building, but it could locate in a mixed use district adjacent there too. And those are the types of things that are specifically listed if they follow the same use standards, I believe, as those prescribed by our RX would then get the same exemptions. I believe that's what this is trying to do. Okay. Is that correct, Keegan? Yes, I think that's correct. Um, I think, and Commissioner Tom Sula, you can um, jump in if I'm off base here, but I think what you're referring to is in some type of other district, um, maybe it's RX, maybe it's something else. Um, RX is pretty limited in terms of what type of commercial uses are permitted and, and typically allowing them within an apartment building type, but a commercial use within, as you kind of pointed out, maybe a detached house in some other type of mixed use district having to comply with paper transitions, whereas a um, short-term rental would be fully exempted under the draft ordinance and looking at the disparity. Is that, is that correct? Right? Yes. And um, yeah, and I, again, I, oh, sorry, go ahead. I guess also, you know, for better or worse, I'm just I'm trying to like keep this clean and not making assumptions for what's coming at us and trying to not put the cart before the horse because, you know, um, right now, short-term rentals, to, to the best of my knowledge, are not allowed in standalone single-family houses. And so, I, and maybe I'm incorrect, but, you know, I mean, I guess they might be in a mixed-use district. I know that that's why we have a text change to clarify a lot of this, but I just... I, and I don't want to waste a ton of time on this. We can follow up afterwards or make a motion to say that we just strike it for simplicity. I just am really confused, especially for small businesses. I know a ton of people who have small businesses that are in detached structures that, you know, or are, you know, I don't know. It, um, it just seems to me that yes if you are in a mixed use district and you are a commercial use they all should be treated the same through this text change right now because the assumptions that we have it's not what's in front of us right now about short term rent so just to clarify uh, uh commissioner tom so your your concern is including short term rental in Section one C. Is that right? Yes. If we remove short term rental, I think it was anticipated that the short term rental text change would beat this text change to the committee, but it did not. It got held up for other reasons. And so I think I think that's something if the committee wanted to make a recommendation on the text change with an edit to that section. I think that's something the committee could do to, to move it forward if you all wanted to move it forward tonight. Okay, I could support that. I, I could support that. I think we need to move it forward. I think 
Matt's points about the more I read section 1C is talking specifically about living units, cottage courts, and then it, it kicks over to sort of a short term rental. And so that, that makes sense to me to, to keep that simplified. Um, and so if that's what we need to do to, to push this out to the full commission, I'd support that. I support that as well. That makes sense. The former represent the building structure types as opposed to the uses, which might, from a statutory interpretation standpoint, suggest an exclusion of other uses. So I'm 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 with you guys. I'm in agreement on as well. Commissioner Fox, I saw your I'm sorry, Commissioner Fox, I saw your hand go up. Did you have anything? We can't hear you, Commissioner Fox. Can you hear me now? Yes. Um, no, I was just also, I just wanted to follow up and also give my support to um, Commissioner Thomas's uh, idea for the edit. Okay. Um, I'm not seeing any more hands up from the panel. Do we have any questions or comments from um, anybody from the public? Les? I am not seeing any. I think Joe Whitehouse had indicated. Oh, there's a question mark. Yeah, right. Joe Joe Whitehouse indicated he had a question, so I don't I don't know what it is. Uh, no, I didn't have a question, but I couldn't find a hand to raise for this uh, not being on the screen. So, um, all I just wanted to say is that this is part of a cleanup process for the senior housing uh, code. Really, since the UDO came into place and uh, I just uh, appreciate y'all's work on this. And I think this is a good cleanup. Uh, we originally started this back in February of 17, the original UDO. Uh, David was a part of this. Matt was a, was a big part of it as well. And uh, the, um, uh, just to add some context a little bit to the question about the type B1 transitional protective yard is that it was added at the council table at the last minute uh, in a very whimsical fashion um, because there's no other multifamily uh, apartments or townhomes that are required. And the only the only uh, uses in the code today that require that is heavy industrial manufactured housing, public or in institutional use. And and I would I'd pretty much say having developed a number of senior housing that uh, I don't think we put a big impact on our neighbors when we go in somewhere. Um, in fact, I think most neighbors look at us as a as a really good, stable, standard use. Uh, and and our our seniors stay wild till about 7:30 at night, and then they go to bed. So uh, we, uh, we 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 tend to be a pretty good neighbor. So thank you for your work on this. Thank you, sir. Um, so I'm hearing that we're wanting to move this forward to the full commission. Is there, um, do we need to take a vote to do that or? Yes. Okay. I move forward that we uh, move case number TC620 forward to the full commission with recommended changes as prescribed by staff. Is that for a motion? And, and just to confirm that change is to strike short term rental from section 1C. Is that right? That was the only change. I just want to make sure we have all the changes. Right. I'm sorry. That's, that's correct. Okay. Right. Um, I'll send a second from Commission. Second. Okay. All in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? So I'm seeing a vote of five to zero in favor of moving this forward to the full plan. With our rec that that would include our recommendation, or do we need to say anything about that, or reasonable and in the public interest? I don't think the committee doesn't necessarily have to make that recommendation. That the planning commission has to make that recommendation, um, but it's not necessary for the committee's report. It'll Sounds show good. up All on right. the agenda. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Um, do we have anything else to add or any questions or comments before I adjourn this meeting? <laughs> Not saying any. 
Thank Great you, job, Anna. CJ. All Great right, job. thank you for the CJ. Thing. And uh, we'll see each other, I guess, in three weeks for that um, planned meeting, not planned meeting, but in three weeks um, from today, I guess. So see you guys then. Thank you. All right. Good luck, Lanny.